Zlatan. Uh, good, so we'll start with uh, the actual program now. Our um, first uh, speaker is uh, Noah Stevens Davidowitz, who's, uh, I guess, at Simons now. He's been a MIT postdoc, uh, and he'll talk about his work with uh, his PhD advisor, Oded Regev, from uh, New York University, uh, on a topic of, of geometry. So, geometry is the first <coughs> word in the workshop title. And uh, this is a, a work that uh, was a real breakthrough, um, actually, I think proves a conjecture of Daniels uh, from a few years earlier. And uh, the applications to computer science are, are really just uh, starting to emerge. There have been a few so far, but there will be many more, we're sure. Uh, so uh, we'll end up in a while. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Daniel, Krista, and Daniele. Uh, I'm very excited about this workshop, really enjoying this program in general. Um, so as Chris said, I'm going to talk to you about um, a sort of purely uh, geometric theorem, which we call a reverse Minkowski theorem. Or Daniel probably named it that. Um, it was originally conjectured by Daniel. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know, I think it's really cool. Um, so let's begin. Uh, before I tell you what a reverse Minkowski theorem is, let me tell you what Minkowski's theorem is. Uh, so you've probably seen this already, but uh, it's so beautiful you might as well see it again. Um, uh, so a lattice, to start from the beginning, is a discrete set of vectors in n-dimensional space. Here's a two-dimensional lattice. Um, you should picture n dimensions if you can. Um, it's specified by a basis, b1 through bn, linearly independent vectors. We've all seen this before, I think. Uh, so here's a basis for this lattice, and the lattice itself is a set of integer linear combinations <coughs> of the basis vectors. So we get this nice, beautiful periodic set, um, discrete periodic set in, in n-dimensional space. Um, uh, uh, so uh, usually, if you're a computer scientist, the, like, the least interesting lattice is, is Zn. Um, but actually, for this talk, the integer lattice, so the set of all points with integer coordinates, or the lattice um, whose basis is like the identity matrix, is actually kind of the example that you should think of. Um, it's actually sort of the geometrically most, uh, it's like the extreme case for us. Um, uh, so I want you to keep Zn in mind uh, sort of as uh, uh, the talk goes. Um, OK. Uh, so we're going to be talking today about sort of the fundamental, or one of the fundamental uh, geometric questions about lattices, which is how many lattice points uh, are there in a ball of radius r? So this will be my notation for that. I'll just write L intersect BR and <coughs> take the cardinality of it. Um, so for example, this, uh, this ball has seven points in it. Um, uh, and we're going to be interested in answering questions uh, like this based on uh, certain properties of the lattice. Uh, so you might recognize like a, sp a special version of this problem. So a special case is uh, the question of what's the length of the shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. Right? So from this perspective, that's just um, the, the radius of the, uh, the, let's see, the smallest radius of a ball that contains uh, only one point, or the largest radius of a ball that contains at least two points, whatever you like. Um, right, so this is a special case, but more generally we can ask how many lattice points are there um, uh, inside a ball of a given radius. Um, and okay, so this is going to be interactive. There's actually a pop quiz. Um, uh, uh, so let's, let's play with Zn. Uh, let's ask how many points are in a ball of radius one uh, in Zn. You're only allowed to answer if you've never thought of this before. Five. Huh? Uh, N. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I draw two, but think of n. At least five. <laughs> At least five. <laughs> Wait, you're going to say it. Two to the n plus one? Uh, two, two times n plus one, I think is what you meant. Right, so there are uh, sort of all the uh, unit vectors, and then uh, there are negations, and there's zero as well. Um, OK, slightly harder. Uh, how many in a ball of radius square root two? Right, so these are the vectors that have like two non-zero coordinates. All right, nobody. <laughs> Not a very interactive crowd. Um, here's the answer. Uh, uh, so this is 4 times n choose 2, which is the number of ways to like put plus minus 1s in n coordinates. This is, and then this is just the previous guys. So they're about n squared. Um, more generally, uh, uh, I won't torture you because you guys don't seem into it, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, for radius r, strictly less than, or significantly less than square root n, it turns out that the number of points in a ball of uh, radius r is roughly n choose r squared. 
Um, and that's just because it's the number of ways to put R squared uh, ones in uh, uh, n spots, um, which is like n to the R squared, or I like to write things in exponentials, so it's like exponential log n times R squared. Um, uh, uh, and uh, if you go to a ball of radius root n or larger, uh, then you get exponentially many points. Okay, this is just like a sort of nice fact to know, you know, for cocktail parties. Um, uh, okay, uh, so that's the end. Uh, here's sort of a more general way that we can count points um, in a ball, lattice points in a ball. We can define the determinant of the lattice. So if you're a computer scientist, it's nice to know that the determinant of a lattice is efficiently computable. So you can just define it as the absolute value of the determinant of the basis. Um, but that's also kind of a rather ugly definition in the sense that it depends on the basis of the lattice. The lattice can have many different bases. Um, uh, and it's not even immediately obvious, I think, that uh, you'll get the same answer. So it's not even clear that this is well defined. Maybe I take two different bases um, and I'll get some different determinant. Uh, but it turns out that there's, like, uh, I think, a much prettier uh, geometric definition. So the geometric definition uh, says the determinant is the limiting value of the volume per lattice point that you expect to see. Um, so I take uh, the limit as r goes to infinity um, of the volume of a ball divided by the uh, number of lattice points in a ball. Sometimes it's helpful to think of the inverse here. So it would be like the limiting density of the lattice, so the number of lattice points per ball. Um, so here's a picture. Uh, so uh, we take a ball, just like before, um, but we make it like a lot bigger, or like really a lot bigger. I didn't use vector graphics, so this looks stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and the determinant is uh, uh, as we go to, as this radius of this ball goes to infinity, um, it's the number of uh, uh, lattice points inside the ball. Uh, let me explain to you uh, uh, why this is true. Um, so the reason is I can take my basis, and the basis defines what's called a fundamental parallel pipette. In two dimensions, just a parallelogram, easier to say. Um, and uh, the parallelogram tiles space right, with respect to the lattice. So I can sort of uh, assign to each lattice point, say the lattice point on the bottom left uh, uh, corner of my parallel pipette, um, uh, uh, a parallel pipette. <laughs> uh, and then you can just sort of count the volume of this ball in two different ways. Like one way to count the volume of this ball is just say it's the volume of the ball. We know how to compute that. Um, and other ways to say, well, the volume of the ball is roughly the number of uh, points inside these parallel pipettes. Uh, sorry, the number of parallel pipettes uh, times uh, the volume of the parallel piped, which is the determinant. Um, so you count the volume in two different ways, and you see that these two quantities have to be the same. Uh, otherwise, math breaks. Um, so what you get out of this is that the Determinant is the inverse of the global density of the lattice. So it tells you um, how dense the lattice is if you step really far back. Um, but it doesn't tell you, at least not immediately, sort of anything about the density of the lattice in small balls, which is what we usually kind of care about. Like, for example, uh, if we care about the length of the shortest vector, then uh, we don't care about the limit as r goes to infinity. Um, so enter Minkowski. Um, there he is. Um, uh, so he proved in 1889, or he published in 1889, the following theorem. Um, it says, uh, if the determinant of the lattice is small, then the number of points in a ball of a certain radius must be large. Uh, so Minkowski tells you that, well, if, you, if your limiting density is large, then I can promise that you'll have points in a specific ball of a specific radius. Um, the radius need not go to infinity here. Um, and uh, so the specific numbers here, so Minkowski proved something, uh, well, incomparable to this, but morally what he proved is far more general than this. Um, uh, I just pro uh, chose convenient numbers for my talk. But here I took a ball of radius square root n, and I promised you exponentially many points. Um, and sort of the reason that that makes sense, actually this is an absurdly good approximation, um, the volume of a ball of radius, half the radius that I chose is about 2 to the n. Uh, so what Minkowski tells you is that you get the number of points that you would expect, right? The number of points that you would expect is exactly the volume of the ball. Uh, but Minkowski doesn't give you exactly that. He gives you that up to a factor 2 in the radius. Does that check out? OK. Um, uh, so the way I like to think about this, or the way I've come to think about this, is that global density implies local density, right? So 
um, if on a very, very large scale my lattice um, is dense, uh, then uh, uh, it must be dense on a smaller scale. Uh, so this theorem is important. Uh, here's my evidence of important, which does not show up very nicely on this screen. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole Wikipedia article. Um, I'm damning it with faint praise. It, it's more important than that. Um, and just, I guess I kind of already said this, but I don't want to lie to anyone. What Minkowski proved is actually slightly different. Uh, Daniele, in uh, the first talk of the boot camp, gave uh, Minkowski's actual theorem. I'm proving uh, something slightly different because it's more convenient for my talk. Um, OK. This is Minkowski's theorem. Uh, and I'm going to show you a proof because uh, it's so easy. Um, and it's beautiful. Uh, except I'm just going to cheat a little bit. Instead of uh, two to the n points, I'm going to show you that there are two points. Right? So one would be trivial. Two is non-trivial. Uh, this is usually the form in which you see Minkowski's theorem. Uh, and it turns out that the proof for two to the n points is basically the same. It just requires a little bit of bookkeeping. Um, OK. So here's a proof of Minkowski's theorem. Uh, again, good for cocktail parties. Um, so we're going to take our lattice, and we're going to imagine um, a ball of radius uh, square root n over 2. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assume that Minkowski's theorem is false. So I'm going to assume that in a ball of radius square root n, I only have one point, just 0. Uh, so in particular, that means um, if I place this ball around 0, I guess this is 0, um, uh, this ball won't touch any other lattice points. Uh, but actually, this ball has a radius square root n over 2, not square root n. So by triangle inequality, I can actually place a ball around every single lattice point, um, and none of them will overlap at all, right? just by triangle inequality. Because every lattice point, uh, uh, by assumption, has to have distance uh, root n to any other lattice point. Yeah? Um, and what's important about this root n over 2 is that, I guess I told you something more accurate earlier, but all that's relevant is that uh, the volume of this ball is at least 1, uh, strictly larger than 1, actually. Um, and then again, um, uh, we're just going to count volume in two ways, right? So um, uh, the, de the definition of the determinant tells you that um, you expect to have, uh, for a lattice with determinant most 1, you expect to have at most volume 1 per every lattice point. Uh, and this gives you volume strictly larger than 1 for every lattice point. Um, so that's a contradiction. I guess formally, you can like, take a gigantic ball and uh, count the number of points inside and add up the volume uh, of these balls and compare it to the volume of the ball. But uh, all you have to know is that you get m more than uh, one unit of volume per lattice point, which is a contradiction. Uh, to prove the 2 to the n thing, instead of uh, thinking about balls that are disjoint, you think about balls that like uh, only intersect a little bit, uh, or the number of balls that intersect in any given point should be small. Um, but it's basically the same proof. OK, that's Minkowski's theorem. If you've not seen it before, now you have. Um, now I'm going to tell you about reverse Minkowski. Uh, so remember, in 1889, um, Minkowski came and uh, uh, gave us this beautiful theorem, which says that if the determinant of the lattice is small, then the number of points in a ball is larger than 2 to the n. Uh, enter Daniel DeDouche, who's sitting right over there, uh, now at CWI, and uh, he has color photographs of him. Um, uh, he said, in 2012, is there a converse of Minkowski's theorem? Uh, and as far as I know, it took, uh, th what is it, 125 years or whatever, 123 years, I guess, um, uh, for, for someone to have this thought, uh, <laughs> which I think, I think uh, is a really good thought. Uh, it's obvious in hindsight, which is the best kind of thought. Um, uh, so one way to phrase this is, does local density um, imply global density? Remember, Minkowski's theorem was the other way around. It tells us if we're globally dense, then we must be locally dense. Daniel's kind of asking, uh, if we're locally dense, must we be globally dense? And I'm just going to tell you now, I'm sort of going to play with the contrapositive of this. Like, I'm going to sort of rephrase this in a few different ways. Uh, uh, so just be sort of aware of that. I think I, my first rephrasing already happens here. Um, so let's make a first attempt at uh, making Daniel's question uh, precise. Well, uh, getting a question that, that is worthy of Daniel. So first, we'll ask a dumb question. Um, uh, so if a lattice has more than 2 to the n points in a ball of radius roughly root n, um, uh, does this mean that it has to have small determinant? Here's our first question. If you've never thought of such things before, uh, you may answer. Okay. Uh, so the answer is no. Um, why is the answer no? It's because lattices can look like this. 
Right? Are people following me? Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> interaction. Um, <laughs> okay. So, right? So, what is this? This is a lattice that's sort of dense in one direction. It has a very dense sublattice. Um, uh, so, let's just sort of make this concrete. Let's say, so S is some gigantic number. Maybe it goes to infinity. Um, and let's say the distance between points um, uh, along this sort of dense subspace is 1 over S. And maybe the distance between these uh, uh, sort of two rows is S squared. Uh, the determinant of this lattice is going to be S. So, in other words, I can make it as large as I want. Um, uh, and if I look at a ball of radius r, the number of lattice points in a ball will be, uh, in this ball, will be at least r times s. Uh, if I did that right, I think I did. Um, uh, so this means I can make the determinant as large as I want while simultaneously having as many points in a ball as I want. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're mathematicians or computer scientists. We don't give up so easily, right? So uh, we try to conjecture something. We find a counterexample to our conjecture. What's the next conjecture? Right? The next conjecture is that the counterexample that you found is the only counterexample. Right? Uh, uh, so we can ask a slightly more refined question, which is if a lattice has more than 2 to the n points in a ball of radius roughly squared n, does it necessarily have a sublattice that has small determinant? Uh, so in the previous slide, I showed you a lattice that has a sublattice with small determinant. So formally, a sublattice, I take the intersection with some subspace of, of uh, the, the original lattice. Um, so Daniel conjectured. Uh, yes, or he conjectured uh, something morally equivalent to this statement. Morally equivalent? Okay. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the reason I'm talking about this, well, it's still interesting even if it weren't true, but uh, is because the answer is yes and we've proven it. Um, so, in other words, local density doesn't necessarily imply global density. That would be too good. There's sort of a trivial counterexample. Um, but it does imply global density over some subspace. Um, okay, so let's uh, stare at uh, this theorem here. Uh, here it is in all its glory, or one version of it. Um, uh, so we say if all sublattices, so I'm sort of switching to the contrapositive as, as I like to do. We say if all sublattices uh, have determinant at least one, um, uh, then uh, we have, have to have at most two to the n points in a ball, uh, where you know I'm losing some gigantic constant in the exponent, which we'll ignore amongst friends. Um, so let's compare this to Minkowski's theorem. Minkowski tells us that if the determinant is at most one, uh, then we have to have many points inside a ball. Uh, and you'll see that these are kind of tight-ish. Um, uh, I have to look at sublattices, but we saw that that's kind of necessary, and there's a giant constant hiding there. Um, but otherwise, uh, uh, quite similar. Uh, so let me say a few things about uh, this theorem. Uh, so first of all, this is a, a toy version. It's just kind of the easiest one, uh, the most natural one for me to write down. Uh, we actually prove bounds uh, for any radius r, not just for radius square root n. Um, uh, and actually, what's more important is kind of to bound the, the Gaussian mass uh, of the lattice. So you kind of want to, maybe this expression is slightly too complicated. You want to bound the minimal s such that uh, uh, you don't have e to the s squared times r squared in a ball of radius r for any r. Um, and the reason for this is, well, it becomes slightly clearer. Um, but for the bound that we actually want, uh, so th this theorem is like quite tight. But for the bound that we actually want, we're actually a little loose, I guess is the point that I want to make. Um, I don't think I'll even show you the bound that we actually want, but oh, maybe I will. Um, uh, uh, and when you state this conjecture appropriately, the worst case should be Zn. Uh, so again, for this exact statement, the worst case is not Zn. Uh, but morally, what is Zn? It's the lattice that is tight for all these constraints. It's got as many lattice sublattices as you can uh, that have determinant exactly one. Uh, so it satisfies the constraint, but it's tight on all of them. Uh, so morally, Zn should be the worst case here. Um, and uh, we think that it is. Um, and maybe this is obvious from the fact that we call this a reverse Minkowski theorem, but this is like very different than what people normally study. Uh, so in particular, uh, what people are normally interested in is things like sphere packings and coverings and things like that. Um, and uh, these are questions about uh, uh, how globally dense you can make a lattice uh, without making it too locally dense. Um, uh, and Minkowski's theorem tells you that your packing can't be too great, um, can't be too good. Uh, uh, whereas we kind of say that all packings are kind of OK um, uh, uh, in, in, in a vague sense because of these sublattices. But somehow, like, we're studying the worst possible packings, which usually don't interest people very much. 
Um, uh, but it turns out that, that this has um, a number of applications. Uh, in fact, many of the applications uh, predate the theorem. They're due to uh, uh, Daniel and Oded. Um, so first of all, there's like a natural application to the complexity of lattice problems, and then there are more subtle applications. But like a natural application, remember I mentioned that the determinant is efficiently computable. Um, so, uh, uh, and we said that if you have uh, many points in a small ball, uh, then there has to be a sublattice of small determinant. So this in particular implies that there's a witness, like an MP witness, for the statement that you have many points inside a small ball. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, uh, I think the d reason uh, uh, Daniel was originally interested in this was because of a, um, uh, uh, an approximation to the covering radius due to Kanan and Lovash, uh, which Daniel will tell you uh, way more about on Friday. Um, so I'm just going to skip over that. Um, it also has applications to Brownian motion on flat tori. Uh, this is a beautiful question due to Salaf cost. He asked, if you have a, a random walk on a torus, you can talk about its mixing time in two different ways. You can say, when does it converge in statistical distance, and when does it incur, uh, converge point-wise? And he asks, are these two things the same? Uh, morally, for like nice spaces, they should be the same. And the reverse Minkowski uh, proves that it's true. Uh, the reason for this is because somehow uh, the flat torus is the dual of a lattice. So uh, this is actually a question about counting lattice points in a ball, just extremely well disguised. Um, uh, and since uh, uh, Daniel and Oded's original paper, we've found a lot more applications. Uh, we found a counterexample, or Oded and Shahar found a counterexample to a strong variant of uh, the polynomial freeman ruja conjecture uh, due to green. Uh, I don't think anyone believed that this conjecture was true, but now we know it's false. Um, uh, 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 with, with Chris and, and Naveed, we showed um, uh, new proof systems for lattice problems. Daniel's going to tell you um, s about some exciting connections with the, the slicing conjecture. Um, and with Barak and Uri Shapira, um, uh, we show connections with Minkowski's conjecture, which is very annoying because Minkowski appears too often here. Um, OK. Uh, I'm going to mention sort of briefly. Uh, hmm? One slight thing about the, the mixing time, it's only like true up to log. Up to log, yeah, OK. I mean, it's, it's, a, no, it's a good open prop. Of it. <laughs> to, to kill the log. Yes. <laughs> OK. Is, is there a lower bound of root log? I guess not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We thought about it at some point. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This approximately is very loose approximately. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, uh, so. Uh, because I think the audience is mostly composed of computer scientists, I'll tell you about sort of a, le a recent um, uh, uh, pair of applications that are kind of the same thing, um, in which we show that you can use this to find algorithms. In particular, uh, uh, I want to find algorithms. I want an algorithm that finds a non-zero vector that is short relative to the determinants of the lattice. So we call this Hermit SVP to distinguish it from, from SVP, which is the problem of just finding a short vector relative to the length of the shortest vector. Um, uh, and the way that we do this is we apply this gigantic heavy hammer of reverse Minkowski to say, look, if your determinant is small, then you have to have a dense sublattice. That's what reverse Minkowski tells you. Um, and then there are tons of algorithmic techniques that only work over dense lattices. Um, uh, so we show that it's enough to have a dense sublattice. Um, and with this, we get uh, uh, some kind of exciting results, for example, we get a 2 to the n over 2 time algorithm for, for Hermit SVP, which is tied up to polylog factors. Um, uh, I think I've lost half the audience. I'll move on. Um, OK. Uh, uh, let me uh, talk about uh, how we prove it. Um, and I think this proof has ideas that um, uh, should be better known in our, our community. They're not due to me. Um, OK. Uh, so as a spoiler, uh, <laughs> The proof is going to go as the proof sketch is going to go as follows. I'm going to wave my hands a lot, and then I'm going to bring out a heavy hammer. Uh, so, uh, uh, if um, uh, so, I'm just going to sort of warn you. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to sort of warn, warn you from the outset. This is going to be unsatisfying. I don't want you to expect a satisfying conclusion where suddenly you understand why this is true. Um, uh, but I still think the, the proof techniques um, uh, are worth doing, and the fact that we need to bring out a heavy hammer at the end is just kind of uh, uh, unfortunate. Um, so also, I think everyone's seen this comment at this point, but it's fine. Um, OK. 
<laughs> oh, maybe some people haven't seen this comic. <laughs> I think it's from The New Yorker. Um, OK. Uh, uh, so first, uh, I want to switch the problem a little bit. So remember, we're interested in counting the number of lattice points in a ball of radius r. Um, and this is kind of, so this is like the lattice point counting function. And it's kind of an ugly function. Right, like in particular, it's discrete, so there's really no way to think of it as like a continuous function, um, uh, and it's typically very hard to work with. Um, so, sort of the first thing that we do, in fact, this is like step minus one, uh, is you switch to a much much nicer function, uh, which I'll write as rho of l, uh, which is the Gaussian mass of the lattice. Uh, so, in other words, it's the sum over all lattice points of um, uh, uh, the the Gaussian mass of each lattice point e to the minus norm of the lattice point squared. Um, and I tried to find my Gaussian t-shirt today, but I couldn't find it. I have this picture on a t-shirt. Um, but the point is that the Gaussian mass is very much your friend. Um, uh, uh, it's very, very pretty. Um, and uh, uh, why it's useful here, well, it's useful here for many reasons. But um, from the perspective of this talk, I guess the reason that it's useful is because it lets you get a handle on the number of points in a ball. In particular, if there are more points in a ball, in a small, more small points in a lattice, then this value goes up. Right. Uh, so if we want to like upper bound the number of points in the lattice uh, in some ball, then it suffices to bound this this guy. Yeah. Um, uh, so here's uh, the theorem as I showed it to you before. Um, here's an alternative version of the theorem, which uh, uh, is closer to, to what we actually call reverse Minkowski theorem. Um, so instead of saying that uh, the number of points in a ball is bounded by two to the order n, I tell you that the Gaussian mass is bounded by two to the order n. Um, and uh, I'll give you a sec to stare at this and just notice that this statement implies that statement. Um, in fact, it goes in both directions, so that's not immediate. Um, right, so if I had more than 2 to the n points inside a ball of radius square root n, uh, then my Gaussian mass would definitely be larger than 2 to the order n. Yeah, check out. Um, good. Uh, so we're going to forget about this statement, and we're only going to be interested in this statement. Uh, uh, and the way that we're going to do this, and I think like the proof technique that I'd like to uh, like the computer science community to know more about is instead of thinking about one lattice, we're going to think about the whole space of lattices, um, which is very unnatural for me. Like as a computer scientist, I kind of think of uh, you know math problems like computational problems, like you're given as input a lattice and you want to prove something about it. Um, but somehow, it really, really helps here. If you want to prove something about a class of lattices with a certain property, it helps to think about the whole class simultaneously. Um, for a mathematician, I think this is like tremendously natural. But I think, uh, at least for me, it wasn't particularly natural. Um, uh, so let's think of first the space of all determinate one lattices. Um, it turns out that this is kind of a hideous space. Uh, it's well defined. You can make it uh, well defined. This is an artist's uh, representation. Um, uh, so it's this disgusting space. It, it's well, it's beautiful, but uh, it's not compact. Um, uh, there's a nice Haar measure on it, um, but it, it tends to be difficult to work with. Um, but luckily, we don't need the whole space of determinate one lattices. Um, we only need the space of determinate one lattices that satisfy our constraint from before, right? So we only need the space of determinate one lattices where all sub lattices have determinate at least one. Um, it turns out that this is a very nice space. Uh, so thank you to Barack Weiss for introducing me to it. Um, it's called the set of stable lattices. I don't know why they're called stable. Um, um, uh, but this is a really nice space. Uh, in particular, uh, sort of I think the only property, well, I'll use a couple of properties. The main property that we're going to use here is that this space is compact. Uh, I have a slide prepared in case someone asks me what the topology is. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh -huh. So. I just don't understand why you need the end condition there because if you take any sub lattice L prime of L, mm -hmm. then the determinant of L prime should be uh, the absolute uh, the index multiplied by the determinant of the, the model lattice L in this case. So uh, no, oh good low, lower dimensional lower dimensional sub lattices. So think uh, of the lattice intersected with a with a subspace. Yeah, I mean, I guess this still holds for full rank lattices, but it's, it's interesting for lower dimensional sub lattices. It's not true for full rank lattices. I mean, they true for full rank lattices, but in the case of full rank, then you always have Yeah, then it's not interesting. Than exactly. Yeah, so that is important. So when I say sub lattice, uh, think of a lattice intersected with a subspace. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so if you remember uh, my counterexample from before, it was this lattice that had this very, very dense subspace. 
Uh, so that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the space of lattices without very, very dense subspaces, which morally it's sort of the space of well-behaved lattices. So, like lattices that have very dense subspaces uh, uh, are sort of degenerate. Um, uh, okay, so the space of stable lattices turns out to also be your friend, lots of friends. Um, uh, and how we're going to use this, we're going to return to our question. So we want to bound the Gaussian mass um, over the space of stable lattices. Uh, and we have a compact set here, and we have a continuous function. Does that show? We have a continuous function. Um, uh, so I don't know. We all learned in kindergarten, first grade, uh, when you have a continuous function on a compact set, uh, it achieves its maximum, right? Uh, so there's some global maximizer. It's not necessarily unique or anything, but it achieves its maximum. So there's some lattice, I'll call it L dagger, um, uh, that is necessarily has the maximal Gaussian mass in this whole set. So now it suffices to bound the mass of L dagger. Um, and what's really fun about this, so I sort of started asking a question about a single lattice. I want to know if a lattice has this property, does it have small mass? Um, I switch to the space of all lattices, and then I use that to switch back to a single lattice. But now my lattice is special. Right? Now I know something about it. Um, and I can hope that the fact that it's a global maximizer uh, really makes it uh, uh, have very, very nice properties that allow me to, to bound its mass more easily. Yeah? OK. So here's how our dream proof would go. It doesn't work. Um, or I don't know how to make it work, at least. Um, uh, so I'm going to suppose that uh, the mass, the Gaussian mass, has no local maxima over the set of all determinate one lattices. So over this whole space, I'm going to assume doesn't show so well. I'm going to assume that this never happens. You can never have a, a peak um, if, you, if you plot the Gaussian mass. Um, so this, this doesn't happen. If you like, you can, OK, it's not a convex function, but you could say if it were a convex function, it would have this property. Um, uh, uh, if that's the case, then you know, second grade, I don't know, um, uh, you learn that the global maximizer has to be on the boundary of uh, the, the set of stable lattices. Yeah? Did I lose everyone? I lose some people? Okay. Um, Do you really need point 0.1 for all determinant one lattices or just the stable ones? I just need the stable ones, but it, it's not fun to think about local maxima in a compact set. So like, I, I like to think about local maxima in open sets. So yeah, that's the yeah. Because you mean on the compact set it would be false? Uh, yeah, it's sort of. It depends what you mean by local. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to consider like going out of the boundary in order to define local. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, you can, I mean, you can say sort of what you that that there are no local maxima in the relative interior of the set. Yeah, this is true, right? So all I want to conclude from this is that uh, L dagger must be on the boundary. So all I would need to say is that there are no local maxima in the interior. Uh, I think some people call the interior stable lattices and the full set uh, semi-stable lattices. Um, OK. So now L dagger lives on the boundary of this set. Um, what does it mean to live on the boundary of the set? Uh, remember how our set's defined? It's defined in terms of uh, uh, these many inequalities. Um, and if you live on the boundary of the set, it just means that one of these inequalities is tight. It means that there's some strict sublattice, call it L prime, um, whose determinant uh, is exactly one, right? Um, okay, no complaints. Usually, someone complains here. Okay. <laughs> no complaints. Uh, uh, so let's continue the dream proof. Um, uh, so let's assume that L dagger lies on the boundary, and I'm going to show you why we're essentially done. Uh, here's why we're essentially done. Let me imagine my L dagger. Uh, so I live on the boundary. Remember. That means that I have some sublattice L prime. Here's L prime. Uh, and L prime has determinant one, um, uh, which in two dimensions is kind of boring. It means you know, that this length is one. Uh, but picture high dimensions if you can. Um, uh, uh, and of course, L dagger itself has determinant one. It's a stable lattice. Um, so this height is also one. And again, picture high dimensions if you can. Um, uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I think it's a quite natural thing to do. Uh, I'm going to project. Okay, that entertains me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so in other words, I'm going to sort of uh, only write the y coordinates of these vectors and drop the x coordinates. So this is formally I'm projecting orthogonally 
um, and projecting L dagger onto the space orthogonal to L prime. It's just that little uh, graphic. And uh, if you're fancy, you write this as L dagger quotient L prime. Um, uh, uh, and we have the following uh, fact, which I'm not going to prove, but if you know a little bit about Gaussian mass, it's kind of immediate, which is that uh, the Gaussian mass of L dagger is at most the Gaussian mass of uh, L prime times the quotient. So the Gaussian behaves nicely under these uh, quotient operations. Uh, and uh, uh, if you know any Fourier analysis, this is positive definiteness. Uh, or this follows from the fact that the function is positive definite. Um, uh, but anyway, this is a basic fact. Um, uh, the next thing we have to observe is that L prime and L dagger quotient L prime are both stable. Uh, so the fact that L prime is stable is, is immediate, right? So all the sublattices of L prime are also sublattices of L dagger. They must have determined at least one because otherwise L dagger wouldn't have been stable in the first place. Uh, the fact that the quotient is uh, stable is less obvious, but it just follows from the fact that uh, uh, L prime has determinant one. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively simple proof. Um, so we combine these two things together, and we see that if L dagger always lie in the boundary, um, then we can uh, uh, do induction, uh, right? So we can, we can reduce the case to two lower dimensional problems. Uh, and if you imagine us continually doing this over and over and over again, uh, eventually we'll just reduce to Zn. We'll just reduce to, to the product of n one-dimensional lattices. And once I get to one-dimensional lattice, I don't know how to do this projection thing anymore. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, so we end up saying that um, uh, the, the mass of L dagger is at most the mass of the integers to the nth power, um, which is just the mass of the integer lattice, because it's a product measure. Um, so this would be really fun, because it would show like, the, what, what the global maximizer is. It actually is Zn. I called it L dagger by accident, but it was Zn the whole time. Uh, uh, in fact, if this proof were to go through, you could show that it's unique up to isometries. It's really fun. Um, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Um, sorry for wasting your time. Um, particularly, we don't know whether uh, the Gaussian mass can have local maxima. So maybe we can have like these little pimples. Um, uh, in fact, we think that it probably can. Uh, uh, 24 dimensions, the Niemeyer lattices seem to be counterexamples. Um, uh, so that's like uh, very depressing. Um, uh, although it's not so bad. In particular, this proof technique does work if you scale the lattice down by a lot or scale it up by a lot. We're here a lot squared n. Um, uh, the theorem's not as interesting uh, in these cases uh, uh, for various reasons, um, but uh, it's kind of nice that it works. So for these functions, I can actually show that Zn is the unique global maximizer. Yeah? So why does scaling make the problem go away? Uh, it's really our proof technique. Uh, I think. Um, so uh, the way that we prove this is by studying uh, the Laplacian, the second derivative of this function. And we want to show that uh, the second derivative is effectively always positive. Um, and when you write it, uh, you get some expression uh, in terms of the vector. You get a sum over the lattice. Um, and if all your vectors are long relative to your scaling, um, then every term is positive. Uh, yeah. Um, Probably a better way to see it is just to realize that uh, as you scale, well, OK, as you scale up, let's say, um, uh, the mass on the shortest vectors becomes more and more uh, uh, relevant, right? And the longer vectors sort of go away. Uh, and then, like, morally, it's kind of obvious, of course, Zn is going to maximize, because Zn, you know, uh, has 2n plus 1 vectors of length 1, which is, which is not optimal for stable lattices. Uh, so, I mean, we can show it's exactly optimal, uh, which is maybe mildly interesting. Um, and you get the other way by duality. Um, which, you know, maybe you can guess why the. Yeah? So you um, know that Zn is not optimal, or it might be, but you don't know how to prove it? It might be, but I don't know how to prove it. I think it is. Yeah. I mean, like, what kind of world would we live in if it weren't? <laughs> um, OK, I used to say that about the existence of local maximums. Um, uh, we live in a terrible world. Yeah. Um, if you just look at the maximizer, uh, can you just like sort of, what goes wrong if you just try to sort of scale it down so that it has a sublattice of, of the terminant, until it has a sublattice of terminant exactly one, and then you have something that is actually on the boundary? So, yeah, so remember there was a little bait and switch that I pulled where I switched to only determinant one lattices. 
So as soon as you start scaling, you'll, you'll no longer have a determinant one lattice. So you'll just leave the set. So well, OK, what goes wrong if, you define, if your set is just a set of lattices that have O? I can't bound that, right? Um, yeah, I can take an arbitrarily dense lattice. I need, I need some kind of normalization. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, this is the kind of idea. Like, you want to prove that like, you can just sort of do gradient ascent or descent ascent and just get to Zn eventually, uh, but it's, which I think is kind of what you're saying. Um, but it turns out it probably doesn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. Any questions? <clears throat> So now we have to uh, deal with the unpleasant uh, possibility that maybe uh, our global maximizer is, in fact, a local maximum as well, uh, uh, which would be unfortunate. Um, so in other words, we have to deal with the possibility that L dagger somehow lives inside this set, sort of a pierced heart. Um, um, uh, uh, and what's nice is that if you're a local maximum, then I can say some things about you. right? So uh, if L dagger is a local maximum, uh, well, then I can do some calculus. Uh, what does it mean to be a local maximum? Well, your derivative is zero. So here, your gradient is zero over some crazy space of lattices. Um, uh, and we can write that down. We can write what it means. If you're an expert, it means that uh, the Gaussian mass is isotropic. Uh, I guess we can move to higher derivatives as well, but they don't really seem very useful, uh, well, to me. Um, uh, but hopefully, we could try to use um, the properties of this um, uh, uh, of uh, being a local maximum to bound the Gaussian mass directly. Uh, it turns out this is a very good idea. Um, uh, so let me sort of uh, uh, step back and show you how that proof would go. So here's the slightly less dreamy proof. It still doesn't exactly work, but we're getting closer. Um, uh, so what I do, what we do is uh, we can say if the global maximizer is on the boundary, uh, uh, then we can bound the mass by induction. I showed you this already, right? So then we're done. Um, on the other hand, if, the, Gauss, if uh, the local maximizer, global maximizer, is in the interior somewhere, uh, then we can try to uh, use the characterization of local maxima to bound the mass directly. Uh, and either way, we get a bound on the mass of L dagger, which, which was our goal. Um, uh, so this is a, a proof technique. Well, OK, it was introduced to me by uh, Barack Weiss uh, from a paper of his with Uri Shapira. Um, uh, uh, and I think it's a really, really beautiful technique. Um, it's uh, uh, kind of similar to, I think, some stuff that we're going to see uh, later in the workshop. Um, so here's how our actual proof goes, um, uh, uh, as much as I can show you. Um, so a big problem is that I don't know how to do anything with these local maxima of the Gaussian mass. Uh, so as I said, very unsatisfying. Um, uh, the problem is that like, we don't know much about the discrete Gaussian in general. Uh, I mean, it's been around for a while, but I think it's only uh, really been studied extensively for maybe 30 years or so. Um, uh, so our solution is to just sort of move to something that's been studied by lots of smart people for a really long time. Uh, so we switch to a convex body. Um, the specific convex body that we switch to is the Voronoi cell of the lattice. So this is the set of all vectors that are closer to zero than to any other lattice vector. Um, and if you think about it sort of morally, if the lattice scales up, the Gaussian mass of the lattice should go down, and the, Gaussian, the Voronoi cell gets bigger, so its Gaussian mass should go up. So somehow, this is kind of like the reciprocal of the Gaussian mass of the lattice, being super duper hand wavy. Um, uh, but the, the nice thing is that the Gaussian mass of convex bodies is very well studied, um, uh, uh, far better studied than, than Gaussian mass of lattices. Uh, so then we use the same high level proof structure. Uh, but now we work with this function instead, right? So again, we say, look, if we live on, if our global minimizer now, because I took a reciprocal, if our global minimizer uh, uh, lives on the boundary, then I know what to do by induction. Um, if our global uh, minimizer uh, is uh, uh, in the interior, um, then I, I bound the mass directly. We bound the mass directly. Um, uh, uh, and the way that we do that is we observe that if the gradient is zero, um, uh, then uh, the Voronoi cell has to be in isotropic Gaussian position. So the, the Gaussian distribution restricted to the Voronoi cell is, is the identity matrix. The, uh, the covariance is the identity matrix. And then we bring out very heavy hammers. Uh, so we use the L position uh, and the B conjecture uh, to say, if you're in isotropic Gaussian position, then your mass is bounded. 
Um, so, yeah. <laughs> the boundary you showed us how to bound the mass by induction yeah, yeah. when it's in the interior you said you use some properties and bound it directly uh -huh. can you tell us a little more about that about, about this step <laughs> well i don't know which step you're using but how do you <clears throat> okay okay so we bound it directly because uh, we show that okay if you're a local maximizer then your gradient has to be zero over some space um, and uh, 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 we compute the gradient. Um, and the gradient turns out to be just the covariance of the Gaussian mass. Um, uh, uh, and having gradient 0 corresponds to being isotropic, so having uh, identity covariance. Um, and then this is like a, like a well-studied problem, the Gaussian mass of, of convex bodies in general um, uh, when they're isotropic. Well, what is the Gaussian mass of the Bohr Truncated, yeah. So it's the probability that a continuous random variable, continuous Gaussian, will land in the core of Yeah. There's a heavy hammer. It's called the conjecture. Do you think that your result is? Uh, no. <laughs> it's it's a it's a proving conjecture. Yeah. It's got a terrible name as well. There, there, um, there, yeah, and I think I, I think B is Banachek, by the way. Yeah, I'm not sure, but Banachek conjectured it. Yeah. Uh, but there's a, there's yet another heavy hammer, right? Like, the two to the n is uh, from. Oh n. yeah. Okay. The theorem I've been showing you uses a different heavy hammer instead. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> At this level of generality, I don't think I don't think we care. Um, for some reason, my animations do something weird now. So you uh -huh. you you, uh, you completely dropped the fact that it's a Voronoi lattice. Yeah. 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 And that might cost us root log n. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we completely ported the problem to stuff that people have already studied. That was that's how I think of it in hindsight, at least. Um, but you, I think it's worth mentioning one part of the magic, which is that uh, I mean, you talk about uh, a point which is a, sort of a critical point for. Um, okay, let's say we assume it's like a global minimizer of the Gaussian mass of the Voronoi cell. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, you don't really know anything about minimizers, so you just say it's a critical point, yeah. right? Yeah. And then by magic, this turns into uh, when you switch to the convex geometric side, that you've magically put the Voronoi cell in the position which maximizes its Gaussian mass. Yeah. So you've like completely flipped the problem. Yeah. Which seems to make it kind of perverse that there may be. Uh, Local. Uh, yeah. I guess I don't know that there are local minima of, of that particular function. Right. Um, yeah. I don't want to compute that function. It doesn't sound fun. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We do do this. Like, there's this weird flip where, uh, in fact, if you're a local minimum of this function, then you're a local maximum of a different function. Which, um, global maximum, actually. Uh, um, so I will actually show you the theorem. Um, this, is, this is the actual theorem. Uh, uh, what I showed you before is, is also a theorem, but it's, 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 it was observed by Daniel. Um, uh, uh, and it's very nice, but it's somehow uh, uh, not exactly what, uh, what we want. Um, so this is the actual theorem. It says if you scale up the lattice by um, a log n factor, um, uh, then the mass is at most 2. Um, and having mass at most two is very nice uh, Fourier analytically. It means the dual is smooth, uh, uh, which is fun. Um, uh, and just some remarks again. So this is uh, the statement that where the worst case uh, should be z n, uh, and that should be just for all parameters t. I should just be able to write here uh, uh, mass of t times z n. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and this is off by a factor of log n. Uh, if you think about it, the, the point counting that I showed you forever ago where you guys didn't like the pop quiz, um, uh, there, uh, that tells you that the right parameter here for Zn is exactly square root log, or square root log n times some constant. Uh, maybe the way I formulated it actually is exactly square root log n. Um, uh, and the point of this is that it's really useful for Fourier analysis. 
Um, like for example, you can switch to the dual, uh, and because you have this very tight uh, upper bound um, on uh, the Gaussian mass uh, of the primal, you can immediately see that the dual lattice uh, uh, has mass that's very, very uh, well constrained, uh, which is pretty fun. Um, uh, uh, more generally, we like smooth lattices, you know, so we have these algorithmic applications uh, uh, that use smoothness all over the place. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me summarize. Uh, so Minkowski uh, gave us a lower bound in the number of lattice points in a ball based on the determinant. Uh, it's tied up to a constant factor in the radius, uh, which I think I said. Um, it has innumerable applications, uh, Wikipedia page. Um, what we prove is an upper bound in the number of lattice points uh, in a ball based on the determinant of sublattices. Uh, uh, and it's like reasonably tight-ish, and it has some applications, uh, so pretty good. Um, uh, our proof technique is, is due to uh, Uri Shapiro and Barack Weiss, at least uh, they introduced it to me. Um, and it's this really fun topological analytic approach uh, that I think should have a lot of other applications. Uh, uh, I know to most mathemat mathematicians in the audience this is like old news, but um, uh, I think we computer scientists don't use it enough. Um, in particular, uh, Daniel's going to talk about this a lot more, but we use it to show, well, he's not going to talk about Minkowski. Um, but we use it to show interesting connections with the slicing conjecture. Uh, so you can just sort of uh, replace the Gaussian mass with your favorite function on lattices um, and, you know, go nuts. Um, okay, so I'll leave you with some open questions. Uh, so the big open question, uh, uh, I think, you know, if you're ambitious, is to just prove that Zn is the uh, uh, global maximizer of this beast for all t. Uh, that would be a lot of fun, and I, I bet the proof would be pretty. Um, and if you can't do this, maybe do it for, for other functions. Uh, in particular, if you know what the Epstein zeta function is, that's a really nice candidate. Um, uh, uh, another thing that we'd like to do, this is from uh, Daniel O'Dead's paper, um, is we'd like to be a little more fine-grained about this. Uh, so I realize that this is hard to read. Um, uh, but what we want to say here is, look, uh, Minkowski's theorem you can rephrase it in terms of sublattices as well. You can say Minkowski's theorem tells you if you have a dense sublattice, uh, then um, the number of points inside a ball uh, should be at least the volume of uh, the corresponding dense sublattice, a ball with the corresponding, uh, in the corresponding dimension. Uh, so it gives you like this sort of hierarchy. Um, and you can sort of uh, uh, write down sort of the bound that Minkowski gives you, which will be this. It'll be uh, the k-dimensional volume, where k is the rank of uh, your sublattice um, of a ball of radius r divided by the determinants of the ball. Um, and you can ask, how tight is this? Uh, uh, and as far as we know, that's super tight. Um, but yeah, we don't know how to prove it. Uh, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, yeah. Hmm? But then you, I mean, you can't mention that we know that that is false for convex bodies. Yes. Well, what about other norms? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I think Daniel's going to might say a little bit more about this. Um, but the reason Daniel originally conjectured this was because he was interested in integer programming. Right? Um, and uh, in particular, if you could prove something analogous to reverse Minkowski um, for other norms, uh, uh, then you could maybe get a two to the order n time algorithm uh, uh, for, yes? The rank is the rank of uh, L prime. Yes, that should be the rank of L prime, yeah. Um, so if you could prove something like reverse Minkowski for, um, uh, uh, for arbitrary norms, then I think you'd get a log n to the n time algorithm, or isn't it 2 to the n? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, reverse Minkowski was a tool to prove this kind of canon lova stuff, which we didn't talk about. Yeah. And it's the general norm version of that. Uh, 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 there, there's stuff that you can prove in this space that would give you uh, uh, fast algorithms uh, for integer programming, which is you know, uh, Daniel's favorite question. I don't know. Um, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So the general norm question is it isn't clear what it looks like exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. It, maybe for reverse Minkowski, not so much, but. That's what I mean. For, for reverse Minkowski. Uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, the, so we tried to pose a version of this where you replace the ball by a general convex body. Yeah. And that is, uh, like, and then the question was whether you could get Cn 
that constant in, next to r uh, to be uh, to be like five. Yeah. Uh, but that it turns out for general convex bodies that's like n to the one quarter uh, at, least. at least. Yeah. And uh, and it's at most like n or something. But th this, however, is is not. Um, it doesn't necessarily say anything about the conjecture you need for integer programming. It was just trying to generalize this point counting thing to uh, other norms. Yeah. yeah. And what goes wrong there is like you can just tailor your body to the lattice. They can call this whole bunch of lattice points. Uh, it feels like cheating. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so that's it. Thanks. For any more questions? Okay. How big is the space of stable lattices, for example? What is its dimension inside SNN R? Its dimension? I guess it's full dimensional. Um, uh, it, so there's a horror measure on the space of lattices. Um, and I believe Barak and Uri proved that, um, uh, uh, that almost all lattices are stable. Uh, I think like the probability of not being stable is like n to the minus n or something tiny like this. Uh, so it's 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 like all the lattices except for the really weird ones. Um, I guess that's what's going on. Um, yeah. In fact, a random lattice won't be anywhere close to the these constraints. Maybe you already said it, but the log n, the check a log n is optimal or not? No, it's it's loose. It should be root log n. Um, so root log n is tight for um, Zn, and this is because of this like e to the log n times r squared there. Uh, so everything's getting squared. So that log n is like a like a root log n. Um, uh, so what we get is e to the log squared n times r squared. Maybe that was more confusing than helpful. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the short answer is we're we're off by a root n, root log n factor as far as we know. Maybe there's a counter example. <laughs> You know if Zn is the global minimizer for small n? Yes. <laughs> uh, so actually, uh, so I showed that for very small parameters and very large parameters, uh, uh, Zn is known to be the global minimizer. Uh, and like the, the proof from the book just goes through, which is a lot of fun. Um, and it turns out that for n, I believe, at most four, uh, my definition of very big and very small overlap. Uh, so you get everybody, um, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I think it dies at n equals 5. Uh, it might be like a fun exercise to try to figure out what's going on at n equals 5. Um, probably true everywhere. So, Wait, so for all, all sufficiently large n, the n is the other? No, sufficiently small n. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you said large. I might have said something backwards somewhere. But yeah, up to n equals 4, uh, uh, we know it's like the most powerful n. thing. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not one of the largest n's I've heard of. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, just about the counter uh, the possibility of counter examples mm -hmm. uh, is so I, there are like uh, is there anything we could check on a computer by the end of the day like uh, what what's what's the issue with checking whether something's a counter example a counter example to what to the whether something can be a global local uh, oh yeah yeah it would be cool if someone computed uh, the gradient of this beast on the Niemeyer lattices that would be really fun. Uh, we think that they're counterexamples, uh, but you know, I don't really code. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, uh, there is like a super easy uh, thing that you can check, and then maybe it'll be fun to see what happens with the Voronoi cell. Oh, that sounds harder, but I don't know. Some of you are good at this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the set of the sphere that you so there's a measure, um, and uh, uh, there's a natural measure. It's the Haar measure. So it's like the measure that's invariant under linear transformations. Um, and uh, uh, under that measure, uh, the space of stable lattices uh, is very, very large. I mean, um, the way to think about it is like the lattices that aren't in the set of stable lattices, they're like high dimensional analogs of lattices with remarkably short vectors. Uh, uh, and like these are rare. Like random lattices tend to have uh, 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 
all their short vectors of length roughly root n, which is what you'd expect. Um, uh, so random lattices tend to have uh, sort of all their short vectors at length like root n or something because, well, it's true. Um, So we'll stop there and resume at uh, 11.30 for the next talk. Thank you. Now.